Our definition of continuity of a function between metric spaces has its origins in the definition of continuity for functions on the real line, so let's start there. If you've gotten too deeply into the habit of thinking about functions exclusively in terms of graphs, you might find the functions and graphs video linked below useful to watch before we start. Let f be a function from the real line to the real line. We should conceptualize f as an active operation that takes each real number x is given as input and sends it to a real number we denote by f of x as its output. What it means for f to be continuous at a particular point x in its domain should be considered as follows. First, the function f maps our input point x to some point f of x in the codomain. This gets us started. Now we plot all of the real numbers near our point x in the domain, say from x minus delta to x plus delta for some positive distance delta. And we let f map them all into the codomain, obtaining a set of outputs. We now look at what happens to this set of outputs as we decrease delta, squeezing toward x in the domain by tossing out more and more of the points not as close to x. If the resulting output sets in the codomain squeeze closer and closer to the point f of x, then f is continuous at x. If not, f is discontinuous or not continuous at x. For anyone familiar with near numbers, this can be stated very sweetly as f of x plus minus dot fits into f of x plus minus dot. The pause there is all of the difference. But however we say it, the formal logical definition of the statement that f is continuous at x comes out the same, so let's get that sorted out. The main question is, how close to f of x do these outputs need to get? The answer is, as close as we like. We measure the distance with a positive value epsilon and start our definition with for all epsilon greater than zero. This gives us a target for our output points exactly as it did for sequence convergence. Given that target, we need to squeeze our input interval far enough that all of the points in that interval land inside the target in the codomain. Some such positive distance delta must exist, so we continue the definition with there exists delta greater than zero. Now we just have to translate our picture into logic. Let's use y to represent each of the input points we see. Note that there's nothing magical about the variables x and y here. There's no graph, and there are no x and y axes. x and y both represent points in the domain. We finish by saying that if y is in that input interval, that is, if y is between x minus delta and x plus delta, then the corresponding output f of y lands inside the target. f of y is between f of x minus epsilon and f of x plus epsilon. Remember that this statement needs to work for all targets we paint in the codomain, but as long as no matter how small we make epsilon, there is some delta, so that f sends all of those points near x inside the target, we have continuity at x. That's the whole definition of continuity at a point. What we've just written might remind you quite a bit of our definition for convergence of a sequence of real numbers, and this is no coincidence. The only differences are that the center of our target is set by f to be f of x, and instead of making capital N larger and larger to toss out more and more initial terms of the sequence, we make delta smaller and smaller to toss out the input points not as close to x. But the basic idea of shrinking the input set in order to make the output squeeze closer and closer to some target is identical. Looking at the logical definition, if we use a little bit of algebra, we can find our metric on the real line at work in this definition, just as we did for convergence of sequences. Subtracting x and f of x from the inequalities as appropriate, then recognizing that our inequalities can be expressed in terms of absolute values, we should immediately recognize our metric in the real line at play, taking the distance between x and y, and between f of x and f of y. If we put those sets into the function f, and we see the outputs doing anything other than squeezing closer and closer to f of x, then the function f is not continuous at x. The precise meaning of this is given by logically negating our formal definition of continuity at x. It says that there exists some positive radius epsilon, giving a target, so that no matter how small we make delta, there exists a point within delta of x that f doesn't send to a point within epsilon of f of x. In other words, there exist points as close to x as we like that don't land inside that fixed target. Again, we'll focus a bit more on continuity than discontinuity for now, as discontinuity is simply any behavior other than continuity. One more definition before we finish this introduction. What it means for f to be continuous is that f is continuous at each of the points of its domain. In other words, for all x in R, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta greater than zero, so that absolute y minus x less than delta 
implies absolute f of y minus f of x is less than epsilon. If you're keeping score, that's a for all, for all, there exists implies definition. Quite a mouthful. Our language of open balls and open sets will let us trim this down to an extremely tidy statement. So let's move on to continuity of functions in metric spaces to watch the magic happen. To talk about a function between metric spaces, we need two metric spaces, one for the domain and one for the codomain. While they could be the same metric space, we want to make the most general definition possible, and thus one that's the most widely applicable. So suppose that MD and N rho are metric spaces. Each has its own set and its own metric. This metric rho is just a function from N cross N into the non-negative real numbers that satisfies all three axioms for a metric. Rho measures distances between points in N, just as D measures distances between points in M. But as these sets could be different, so could the metrics. The metrics could be different even if the two sets are the same. For example, we could have a function f from the real line into the set of real numbers with the discrete metric, or vice versa. Let f be a function from m to n. If x is a point in our domain, then f of x is a point in our codomain, and the definition of f being continuous at x is the direct translation of our definition in the real line. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta greater than zero, such that d of x y less than delta implies rho of f of x f of y less than epsilon. Its interpretation is identical. The only difference is that our domain and codomain could be any metric spaces, and we use their metrics to measure distances. Given any positive target radius epsilon around f of x in the codomain, there exists some positive radius delta around x in the domain, such that all of the points y within delta of x in the domain get sent by the function f to points f of y with an epsilon of f of x in the codomain. The same remark applies to this last implies as was discussed in our sequence video. It could be written as a for all statement, an implication, or a for all implies statement, and it makes no logical difference. We can now see open balls at work both in the domain and the codomain of f, which let us rephrase this definition. Saying that d of x, y is less than delta was just another way of saying that y is in b delta of x in the domain. And similarly, saying that rho of f of x, f of y is less than epsilon was just another way of saying that f of y is in b epsilon of f of x. Now we can use our definitions of images and preimages to tighten this up further. This last implication reads as a statement about subsets. f maps all the elements of b delta into the set b epsilon of f of x. This means that the image of the set b delta of x is a subset of b epsilon of f of x. Alternatively, we can use the definition of preimage to restate the last bit as y being in the preimage of b epsilon of f of x, which immediately turns this into a subset statement that b delta of x is a subset of the preimage of b epsilon of f of x. So, in terms of open balls, for any open ball about f of x in the codomain, there's an open ball about x contained in its preimage. This last statement about open balls can be quickly rephrased in terms of neighborhoods to get rid of the distance measurements. It says for each neighborhood C of f of x in the codomain, its preimage under f is a neighborhood of x in the domain. Why is this equivalent? Well, first suppose our condition about preimages of open balls. Then given any neighborhood C of f of x in the codomain, there must exist some positive epsilon such that b epsilon of f of x is contained in C. By our hypothesis, the preimage of this open ball contains some open ball b delta of x. But the preimage of the open ball is contained in the preimage of our neighborhood c, and therefore there's some open ball b delta of x contained in this preimage, meaning that the preimage of c is a neighborhood of x and m. The other direction is even easier. Suppose our condition about neighborhoods. Then given any positive radius epsilon, the open ball b epsilon of f of x is a neighborhood of f of x and n. By our hypothesis, the preimage of this open ball is a neighborhood of x and m, so by definition, there is some positive radius delta such that b delta of x is contained in this preimage. You'll notice that our last two formulations of continuity at x both use preimages, which map sets from the codomain of f to sets in the domain, in the opposite direction that f maps points. This change of direction might seem odd at first, but if you think way back to our discussion of images and preimages under functions, the preimage definition was the cleaner one as properties were logically simpler and also much easier to prove. So we're actually happy about stating this definition in terms of preimages.
In the context of metric spaces, we can also formulate continuity of a function x in terms of sequences, which fits our real analysis context quite nicely. It means that if we have any sequence xn converging to x in the domain, then the sequence f of xn in the codomain converges to f of x in the codomain. In other words, we can apply a function continuous at x to both the terms of a sequence converging to x and its limit, and the new statement in the codomain remains true. Let's see how this is equivalent to our open ball definition above, as again, these open balls are our targets for convergence of sequences. Suppose the open ball formulation of continuity at x, and suppose that a sequence xn in the domain converges to some point x. To show the resulting sequence f of xn converges to f of x, let epsilon greater than zero be given, giving us a target in the codomain for this sequence. We need to show that the sequence eventually stays inside this target. We can immediately use our definition of continuity to find that there exists some delta greater than zero in the domain, such that f sends all of the points inside b delta of x inside our target. Since the sequence xn converges to x, it eventually stays inside this ball in the domain. But then the tail of the sequence xn living entirely inside the ball in the domain means that the corresponding tail of the sequence f of xn lives entirely inside the target in the codomain, which is what we needed to show. In the opposite direction, suppose the open ball formulation of continuity at x fails. In other words, there exists some positive target radius epsilon about f of x in the codomain, such that for any positive radius delta about x in the domain, some point inside that ball in the domain gets sent outside our target by f. We can use this to construct a sequence of points xn the domain of f as follows. For each n, take a term xn in the ball b1 over n of x that doesn't hit our target. This sequence xn will converge to x, but the sequence f of xn has none of its terms inside the target ball of radius epsilon so it can't eventually stay inside that target, and thus the sequence f of xn does not converge to f of x. This provides the counterexample we're after. So indeed, in a metric space, we have a logically equivalent formulation of continuity in terms of sequences. Note as we move along that every formulation of concepts in terms of sequences will be starred, because in arbitrary topological spaces, these statements are in general weaker than the actual definitions. All the other formulations imply the sequence formulations, but not vice versa in general. But to be clear, in our context of metric spaces, all these formulations are equivalent, and the sequence formulations can be very useful in real analysis. Now recall that for a function to be continuous means that it's continuous at every point of its domain. This extra quantifier of for all x and m actually yields even simpler definitions. If we add it to our neighborhood formulation, it tells us something short and sweet about open sets in the codomain. Suppose u is an open set in n, and consider its preimage under f and m. What can we say about this preimage? Well, for any point x in the preimage of u, f of x is in u by definition. So since u is open, u is a neighborhood of f of x. Since f is continuous at x, and u is a neighborhood of f of x, its preimage is a neighborhood of x. From start to finish, we've shown that the preimage of this open set U is a neighborhood of each of its points, so it's an open set. This gives us the cleanest and most beautiful logical formulation of a function being continuous, and this is how the field of topology was born. A function is continuous just when the preimage of every open set in the codomain is an open set in the domain. With this in hand, taking complements immediately yields a second equivalent formulation of F being continuous in terms of closed sets. The preimages of closed sets are closed. Our third formulation of continuity is in terms of sequences. The extra for all simply makes our conclusion work for sequences converging to any point in the domain. Given any sequence xn and m converging to some point x, the image of that sequence under f converges to f of x. As usual, this is not fully equivalent to continuity in general, but it's fine, and a useful property of continuous functions, in the metric space context. This concludes the main content of our video on continuity. In our next video, we'll discuss four important properties of metric spaces, connectedness, total boundedness, completeness, and compactness, which will conclude our introduction to metric spaces. Afterward, we'll have the tools we need to approach some pivotal topics in real analysis. Till then.